Good morning. <laughs> Welcome to the Future of Health Summit at Milken. I am Dan Diamond, the author of Politico Pulse newsletter. I'm also writing a special version of Politico Pulse just for this conference. And it's not too late to sign up. If you haven't signed up yet, I hope I can convince you uh, in, in my ability to listen and take notes during the next hour that I will be doing, doing that as well in the newsletter, uh, which, which you can sign up uh, finding, which you can find various uh, ways through links in the program and, and online. I am very pleased to be joined for this panel uh, by, by four physicians, reminding me yet again that I am the least qualified person to talk about this issue. And I will turn it over to them shortly. We're talking about collaboration and how collaboration has been powerful in combating the opioid crisis. That harkens back to remarks that the Surgeon General made at the Milken Institute Forum last year. And, and I want to say before we get started that as, as someone who lives in DC, as a reporter, I find myself running past the museum, the Museum of News uh, downtown. If, if you haven't been, it's, it's worth a trip. And there is a newspaper from every state out front every morning. The Detroit Free Press, the, the Oklahoman, and, and so on and so on. The one story that I see more often than any other story, more than the Affordable Care Act, more than, than the Russia investigation, is, is a story about either the local impact, the state impact, the national impact of the opioid epidemic. This is an issue that hits hard in so many different ways. And understanding that there's considerable coverage of this issue, we, we still don't always understand the drivers or the implications. So I think we're going to begin by turning that question over to this panel and moving down the line, starting first with Dr. Nora Volka, Volkow, the head of NIDA, National Institute on Drug Abuse. And I'll, I'll throw the question to you first, doctor. In a world where we are covering this epidemic in so many different media ways, what what is the thing that you know in your world that you wish more people understood about the opioid epidemic? He sent me that in an email early this morning, and I was thinking about it, and immediately came into my brain. I said, well, what am I going to say? Because he's also throwing it at me the first. And I say the heterogeneity <laughs> of the epidemic, and it is actually uh, how it's heterogeneous with respect to its geographical distribution. It's heterogeneous with respect to the people that it's affecting. It's heterogeneous in the way that people become addicted to these drugs. And this is actually, this heterogeneity is fundamental because it determines how we do prevention and treatment. So what do I mean by heterogeneity uh, on how people become addicted to it? So there are individuals that become addicted to it because they get a prescription opioid and then they become addicted. And yet there are those that become addicted, different, because they are actually um, getting ex their hands into opioid prescriptions that then they are seeking for the rewarding effects. And then they get transitioned into heroin or heroin laced with fentanyl. So that heterogeneity is fundamental because if we are dealing with prevention, what is clear is that one single prevention strategy is not going to work. Um, improving prescription practices for opioid medications is fundamental, but it's not sufficient any longer. You need to address also prevention as more people are starting to use heroin firsthand, and you also need to actually do interventions to prevent from synthetic opioids to actually start to, uh, to, to disperse themselves in the United States. So if you look at it geographically, you also see tremendous diversity. You see a state like Massachusetts that has one of the best track records in terms of prescription of opioids, yes, it has one of the highest mortality rates from overdoses because of heroin and fentanyl being overpowering. Very different from uh, Appalachia, where prescription opioids are very, really had opened up the door for, for the crisis that we're seeing. Heterogeneity in emergency departments. A patient overdoses because they've been given uh, too high of a dose of an opioid for their pain. Your intervention is going to be very different from someone that overdoses there because they actually got um, a laced heroin or they were seeking fentanyl. Or because someone actually who is addicted to opioids actually is planning to commit suicide. So, so your, your ultimate intervention needs to require that heterogeneity. And that's why I think that this is fundamental. It drives our prevention efforts, and it should drive also the, the, the different therapeutic interventions that are necessary to contain the crisis. So the slew of responses that are necessary given the given Heterogenate. The yeah. Dr. Sharif Elnahal, you run 
the health department in New Jersey. What do you know about this crisis that you wish everyone in this room understood too? So I guess I'll start by um, doing things that journalists don't like, which is not directly answering the question. Um, <laughs> but literally my first question. <laughs> <laughs> Give me a hard hour, man. But, but rather to say, uh, just having the benefit of perspective uh, now in the position um, as the state health official, uh, it can't just be one thing that you focus on. And this is very similar to your comments. Um, but it, it isn't just in the sphere of prevention. Um, an example of the things that we're focused on uh, in New Jersey spans the journey. And I really think you have to think about this epidemic um, from the perspective of the individual who is initially exposed, becomes addicted, interfaces with the criminal justice system, and ultimately overdoses and dies. Um, and that is a journey that uh, has important opportunities in each gate along the way uh, to prevent more people from progressing to the next milestone. Um, if you think about uh, this, this problem in terms of the pursuit of a magic bullet, by nature, you're only going to hit a one piece of that trajectory. And if you do that, uh, you're going to get a backstop and unmet need in folks that are inevitably going to um, get past what you're trying to do at each stage. So for example, if you only focus on overprescribing, uh, folks that are exposed on the streets to um, you know, heroin and fentanyl laced heroin, you're going to miss those. If you only focused on medication assisted treatment, uh, you're going to be limited by the capacity of the addiction treatment system uh, in your state or in your jurisdiction. Uh, so by very nature, you have to focus on the whole trajectory and use data to figure out how to allocate resources at each step of the way. So um, a list of examples that uh, sort of or have New Jersey are approaching the unique journey uh, that folks in our state go through, um, offering alternatives to opioid therapies in the emergency room, uh, but also in the post-operative period um, in uh, primary care clinics and other clinical venues, uh, using medical marijuana as yet another tool and physician's tool belts uh, to treat pain uh, in the initial setting which is controversial and not used by every state, but something that we're uh, very invested in in New Jersey. Um, expanding medication-assisted treatment, not just in our um, uh, uh, outpatient treatment capacity, primary care providers, uh, addiction providers, uh, but also in the criminal justice system where too many folks end up uh, and are often at extremely high risk of overdose when they leave because they're naturally uh, detoxed. Uh, when they're in jail uh, in correctional institutions. Uh, and then uh, uh, spanning the entire criminal justice system, introducing medication-assisted treatment um, and all the evidence-based therapies that we can, including the exploration of medical marijuana as an adjunct to medication-assisted treatment uh, is something that we're doing um, there as well. So uh, a lot that we're doing, and that's very intentional because again, if you are too narrowly focused on uh, one stage of this journey that people go through, unfortunately, you're gonna to miss too many people. And I think uh, that's part of the reason why so many states uh, and the nation at large have had difficulty in tackling this epidemic. So can't just focus on prevention and the panoply, panoply of responses in, as, as part of that. And we'll come back to the medical marijuana point, which I think is, is fascinating. Dr. Eleanor McCanns kafts the head of SAMHSA, assistant secretary appointed under this administration, you have seen the opioid epidemic from a variety of different perspectives. You're part of the team in this administration leading the response. What is the piece of this that you feel like isn't fully understood? I think that it's still, um, it's still not well understood that addiction, opioid use disorder, and other substance use disorders are illnesses. They have a neurobiological basis. They are not just behaviors that, that trouble us. They, um, they result from changes that occur in the brain physical changes that occur in the body. And the other thing that is, I wish people understood more, uh, and when I say people, I mean our, our people, American citizens, that we have effective treatments, particularly for opioid use disorder. We have three medications that are approved by the Food and Drug Administration that have been found to be safe and effective for the treatment of opioid use disorder, still are not used to the extent that they should be 
in Americans that are living with these disorders. But in addition to those medications, we also need to uh, recognize that people need psychosocial supports. So that means not only the medical piece of their illness needs to be treated, but also the psychological, the social piece of illness. And that means supporting <coughs> the communities and, and supports in communities that include um, a very wide array of, of people uh, and institutions that can help, such as peers, um, such as uh, assistance with employment, uh, housing, criminal justice uh, 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 resources. All of those need to come together to assist people who are living with what are really very difficult and complex illnesses. And then the last thing I'll say is that there's a very um, there's a very high co-occurrence of mental illnesses in people that have substance use disorders and particularly opioid use disorders. If you were to look at uh, the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, which is a, a survey that the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration uh, puts out every year, uh, randomly speaking with about 65,000 Americans about their substance use, about their mental health uh, and and if you look at that, you would see that people that have opioid issues, over 60% have a co-occurring mental illness, and 25% of them have serious mental illnesses. Those are mental illnesses that are so impairing that, these, that it interferes with their day-to-day -day life. Um, I think that's not well understood. It needs to be appreciated so that people can get all the care that they need. That gives them the best chance to recover. So the interweaving of, of those issues. And Dr. Thomas Graff, Chief Medical Officer for Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield in New Jersey. We have three officials from, from various public agencies and you are representing an insurer. What does an insurer know about <clears throat> this problem? Yeah, no, it's a great question. I, I'd like to say they took my answer, um, <laughs> but that's, uh, that's probably not the point. No, I mean, one of the things, uh, whenever there's a disaster, right, or a crisis, um, there are the folks that are directly impacted by the crisis. There are the responders, the first responders, the second, the third, the fourth. Um, they're the folks that stand at the side of the road and, and sort of admire the crash. And then there's the jackals. And by that, I mean the folks that come along to somehow take advantage of that crisis. And um, as an insurance company, that's something that I think we uniquely have a view on. Uh, some you're, government you're not the jackal. Well. You're, you're no, no, no. The I'd jackal. like to think we're not. I'd like to think we're not. Uh, yeah, that's us, the jack. No, um, that wasn't where I was going, but thanks for bringing that up. <laughs> it's helpful. I'm going to go back to the government answer I, in, indirectly. No. Uh, so yeah, so, so the jackals, no, the jackals are the folks that show up. So, so at Horizon, we spend $100 million a year on urine drug testing. 30% of that is on for members that are having more than 25 tests a year. There is no medical reason, and I'm here with the experts, so if you can explain it to me if there is, that 30% of the patients, there might be a few, have a legitimate need for you know, a drug test every other week for the entire year. If that's how you're monitoring your therapy, it's not working, right? And so we're wasting that money. We're spending it on something that provides absolutely no value to our members. And so while this crisis is big and we need vast resources to respond to it, we have a lot of those resources already in the system. And if we could redirect those resources to something that actually benefits the members, right? So we mentioned medication-assisted therapy. That's probably the best treatment we have. Is it perfect? No. Is it vastly better than nothing, which is what most of these members are getting besides living on the beach in Florida and getting tested every couple of weeks? Um, if we could redirect those resources, we might have at least a shot at getting some of this work done. And so to me, that's an, an, an important piece. Um, and, and what we're working on now is a payment policy that says, you know what, we're not going to pay for urine drug tests if they're not part of a bona fide evidence-based treatment plan like medication assisted therapy. That seems to be a long-term a, a long approach to this, a real solution, as opposed to just trying to isolate those individual bad actors and shut them down. Let's just take away, you know, let's stop feeding them and that will at least be an impact um, in a way that we can add to the, to the conversation that's less jackal-like. Well, ju just a quick follow-up on that. The idea that you might not be paying for certain treatments as a way to incent, or, or different tests as a way to incent change, 
How does that manifest in, in the opioid epidemic in terms of measuring quality outcomes and balancing what's best for the patient? You know, and that's a, that's a real challenge for me. My, my career has been based around sort of highly defining at a granular level quality for disease and then finding a way to reliably deliver that high quality. And in the opioid space and substance abuse, largely in mental health period, we don't have good granular definitions of what quality looks like. And so, you know, as a health plan, we only want to pay for the best. We want the best for our members. I think as physicians, we always want the best. But if we don't have a measure of what best is, if we don't have a definition of best, it's really hard to compare, contrast, and define we're only going to pay for these best services. Now, we have some pieces, right, medication-assisted therapy, but even within that, I couldn't tell you this provider of medication-assisted therapy is actually getting twice the success rate that this provider is. Really like to know that so I can tell our members where to go. If we have a good definition, and that needs to come from some of the folks on the panel, probably a lot of the folks in the room, tell us what that definition is. I, I know I don't know it, but if you tell me what it is, I'll find a way to make sure that we're driving, directing, supporting, and helping our members get to that better treatment. It is October 23rd, 2018. Tomorrow, the president will sign a declaration uh, a year after declaring the opioid emergency, that this is not a, a scoop. Politico did scoop it last week, though, my, my colleagues, Brianna and Sarah. <laughs> How are we doing at fighting this epidemic, which is, is years in the making? Dr. Volka, you've been at NIDA. You've been leading NIDA for 15 years. Where are we on the fight to stop this epidemic? Well, I can say that we have been, I mean, finally starting to win in some fronts that have taken an enormous amount of time over these past 15 years, which relates to what Dr. McCanns was saying, the recognition that addiction is a disease and it needs to be treated as opposed to incarcerated. And what we're observing as a very tragic result of the epidemic is that it's become clear that the way that we were dealing with addiction in general and certainly opioid addiction was not working for us and we needed to change practices. As a result of that, the healthcare system in many ways has been forced to actually recognize that they need to screen and treat individuals, that this is one of the most solid infrastructures that we have. So we are seeing more uh, healthcare systems uh, actually engage on the screening and treatment of individuals with opioid use disorders. And this relates to physicians with very different specialties. And we've all heard how there are now uh, approaches to delivering medications in emergency departments and then referring them to primary care physicians for support. So that element of engaging healthcare, to me, is a victory. <coughs> Another victory is you look at it in terms of the numbers. We are uh, significantly increasing the number of individuals that are being treated with buprenorphine and extended release naltrexone. I don't have the data for methadone, so I wish I had it. So I do not know if we're also observing significant increases there. We are also seeing significant increases in the doses of naloxone, which is the medication that we use to reverse overdoses. Right, the recovery drug. And, and the forward area where we're actually also seeing significant improvements is we're seeing a decrease in the number of opioids being prescribed, in the doses being prescribed, and in the amount of time being prescribed. Now, I think that an element there that I like to again highlight, which is the issue, is that becomes a, a victory provide that, that in parallel we are improving the quality of care for the treatment of pain. And I, for me, it's, it's still too early to determine if we, in parallel to these changes, are actually also improving outcomes in patients suffering from chronic pain conditions. So Dr. Volkow described the evolution in thinking, the use of opioid recovery drugs and the changes in prescriptions. Dr. McCann's cats at, at SAMHSA, how are you trying to put these changes in thinking, these new approaches into practice given the power of your agency? So SAMHSA uh, uh, is, is an important agency for, um, for technical assistance and training to, to providers. And uh, our agency has, has recognized the need to, to really uh, generalize that training to all healthcare professionals. Uh, we've done that 
through over this past year, during this administration, we have changed the way we provide technical assistance and training so that we now, as part of our state opioid response, these are the um, uh, large uh, funds that are going to the states directly so that they can put in place the services that they need for prevention, treatment, and recovery of opioid use disorders. Uh, as part of that, we have put teams in every state, we call it the State Targeted Response Technical Assistance and Training uh, Program, teams in every state to address opioids issues in those states because every state is different. There isn't a one size fits all. Um, each state will have different needs and so we are using local trainers that know their communities and can go into those communities and assist organizations in meeting the needs of people living with opioid use disorders. We've also put in place a, a system of regional technical assistance and training. We now have addiction technology transfer centers, mental health technology transfer centers, and substance abuse prevention technology transfer centers, in addition to special technology transfer centers in each of these areas that assist Hispanic Latino communities and Native American communities. So those programs will provide technical assistance and training to providers so that they can meet the needs of the people they're serving. You, you have used a term that I hear quite a bit in this field, technical assistance. Mm -hmm. Some folks might, might understand that. I will be honest, as a reporter, I hear technical assistance and I think, is this something related to computers, something technical? Uh, could, could you explain exactly sure. what it means? Sure, so, uh, so it's not enough to simply provide education to providers. That's important because they need to understand, as I mentioned, but the neurobiological underpinnings, the epidemiology, the treatment, and how to make sure that patients get the services they need. But that's not enough. You have to be able to implement in your, in your provider settings. So, and there are many in this country. There are primary care settings. There are specialized substance abuse treatment programs. There are community support systems. All of these, all of these groups need to be able to implement. And so we bring people who are experts in helping organizations to actually implement these programs. You have to have both. It's not enough to just have one. And, and you mentioned in your perspective as the head of SAMHSA, you see different states modeling different approaches. Is there a state that you might pull out as an example of, of doing things well, New Jersey, or, or not? Um, <laughs> is, is there a state that, that might be a laggard? Um, well, here's, here's what I would say. Um, our job at SAMHSA is to provide, uh, to provide guidance to the states, to monitor what the states are doing because we do require the use of evidence-based practices. We've been very grateful for the research that the National Institute on Drug Abuse has done under Nora's leadership to provide us those kinds of interventions that we then communicate to our communities and we require that so we monitor that. Each state is different. Uh, as Nora was just saying, there are states that are more affected by fentanyl contamination of heroin than others. There are other states that are more affected by prescription opioids than others. All of these states understand the needs of their people and they are moving forward with evidence-based practices and we're helping them do that. So just like Dr. Ellen Hall, you dodged my question, but, but did it in a very <laughs> artful way. We, we do have two representatives from New Jersey in, in different fields, the head of the health department and the chief medical officer of major insurance provider. Doc, Dr. Graff, you have been playing a role in collaborating on bringing national lessons to New Jersey. Can you describe how that collaboration came to be? Sure, it, it, it's a great um, opportunity. We, what we realized early on was that it, it does in fact take a village, right? That no single entity has the power to reach it and that, as was mentioned earlier, right, the reason that folks got there and most likely the solution for getting out of it is, um, is built across uh, many different stakeholders. And so through, through Milken and through the DEA, interestingly enough, they have a very forward thinking philosophy. It's not about uh, incarceration as the solution. Sure, it's still part of what they do, but what they really understand is that we need to get into the communities and understand the situation and work with 
the housing and the schools and the educators and the universities and the the um, you know communication folks. I mean, one of the things that I found fascinating at, at the meeting was um, that you know the words that we use, and we know this in many situations. So why it would be different in opioids, I don't know. But but I don't think it, it hadn't crossed my mind. I bet it didn't cross a lot of yours. That the words that we use in this space can be very empowering or disempowering in terms of getting folks to effective treatment or helping them sustain that treatment along the way. And so with Milken and with the DEA, we brought in those leaders from across Newark and across the state of New Jersey public officials, private officials, faith-based organizations, educators, to develop solutions. But, but more importantly, and this is where, uh, you know, I think uh, the philosophy of Milken really, really resonated with me, you know, too often in these situations, yes, we all get together and we talk. And we talk and we talk. And we never do anything. And even if we do do something, we get into this mode where we start to confuse motion with progress. So we're doing something. Don't just stand there, do something, okay? That makes sense. And obviously, before you can have progress, you do have to have motion, but not all motion leads to progress. And so we need to focus on that progress. I mean, one of the challenges we had in the state of New Jersey is we created a, a mandate that said everyone gets uh, treatment for 30 days without the insurance company being able to monitor that. And if you're of the mindset that insurance companies are out to deny care, then that makes a lot of sense. Right? Let's get them in. Let's, let's create crisis. But guess what? 30 days in the hospital doesn't solve the neurochemical, biological, psychosocial, and, and social determinant issues that landed them there in the first place. Some patients absolutely need it. Now, my guess is some of them need a week, some of them need two weeks, some of them need probably 45 days, right? But, but rather than mandating the answer, let's, let's think about creating an organized system of care. Right? We've talked about medical home and ACOs and all kinds of things on the medical side. Guess what? Behavioral health substance use disorder needs that same approach. And so, you know, the good news is we've, we've, one of the things we've learned and we've created is now the capacity to build these organized systems of care to make sure that when patients, when members are transitioning from inpatient to intensive outpatient or partial hospitalization or from, you know, from that as a step down therapy over this probably 12 to 18 month journey, which is again, something I learned in the last month myself, that you know what, it takes not days, not weeks, not months, but a year or more to reverse the chemical changes that happen in the brain. You know, unless we're supporting them all the way along, our chance of success is pretty small. And so by creating these organized systems, by working with all these organizations to make sure that we're not sending the alcoholic back to work at the bar, right? Right? Let's set them up for success, not failure. And so that's, that's what we're trying to do. That's the solution we think has the best chance of success. You, you mentioned, Doctor, not to confuse motion for progress. Is there progress in New Jersey that you can point to? I'd love to say, yes, we've solved it. The answer is done. The commissioner has taken us to the nirvana. No, I mean, I th I, I, we've made some progress. We've, we certainly have. We have, you know, a... a um, a nascent system of care, one of them organized and one group that's ready to quarterback that member all the way through. So it has to be done from the provider side. When we try and do it from the insurance side, we, you know, it, it, it is a little big brotherish and I'd much rather having the folks that are actually caring for the member doing that. We've created the system so that we have flexibility in what they do so they can individualize the care. Yes, there's certain things we know everybody needs, but then beyond that, there's that 10 or 15% of the care that needs to be individualized. We've created the payment models to allow that individualization so that the people on the ground who know the patient best, know the member best, can do what's best for the member. We're gonna pay for it. We're gonna pay a reasonable amount, we're gonna pay a set amount, but, but we're gonna allow them that flexibility rather than trying to micromanage it. So um, we're not there, but I think we've got the beginnings of getting there. And, and just to underline a point that you made that the insurer is taking a step back because you don't wanna be big brotherish. Do you know that from from surveys, from data, from what patients are telling you? Yeah, I, well, I, so I, as I'm fond of telling my colleagues, I don't know anything about the insurance industry. Um, and, and it's sort of true. I've, I've been, I wish we'd uh, known that before the panel. Before the panel, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I don't always lead with that, interestingly <laughs> enough. Um, but no, so, so uh, yeah, I've been at Horizon, January will be two years. Prior to that, I spent my entire career on the provider side in education and in leading a, a small integrated delivery system in central Pennsylvania that some of you might have heard of called Geisinger. And uh, you know, from that perspective, I know that the best way to, tr to reach the members, to change behavior, to, has to be from the provider side. Uh, partnership with a, a uh, enlightened, as I like to call it, 
insurer can be really helpful, right? Because you need that flexibility around resource deployment and ability to understand it. But, but patients respond best, members respond best when it comes from their normal care delivery system and their providers. Uh, we can help, we can assist, we can provide information, we can provide connections. But at the end of the day, all we can do is enable or not um, a, a highly effective provider system, which is part of the reason I want to know what quality looks like, so that I know I'm making progress and not just having motion. Because we, we're great at measuring motion, it's harder to measure uh, progress. Dr. Elnahal, you have spoken in the past about the risk to prisoners who are at, at higher risk of relapse, uh, of, of addiction. What are you doing in New Jersey to focus on that population? So. Part of the reason that um, a lot of states and the country at large have still not made progress uh, when you measure it by opioid overdose deaths, uh, they continue to rise. Uh, in New Jersey, we now have eight deaths per day from the opioid epidemic. We're on track to reach 3,000 opioid overdose deaths this calendar year, which will give us the unfortunate distinction of being in the bottom 10 states in terms of deaths per capita. Uh, is that we are not, number one, making use of data systems and building data systems uh, that target where the problem is. Uh, and what I mean by where the problem is, not just geographically, but in types of vulnerable populations and the institutions they go through. Um, and unfortunately, the criminal justice system has consistently been identified as a place where some of the worst uh, impacted uh, and highest risk individuals reside, particularly in jails. Uh, these are people who, uh, unfortunately, there's a, an over 80% um, frequency of substance use disorder uh, in inmates. Um, a huge majority of that is opioid use disorder specifically. Uh, they are incarcerated. Uh, they are detoxed by default because the vast majority of them, if the correctional facilities are doing their jobs, don't have access to opioids. Uh, if they're not connected to treatment, in particular medication-assisted treatment, uh, while they're in jail and there isn't a good program for their reentry back into society, they will often start using again when they leave. And because they were using such a high dose, often now with all of the uh, terrible types of opioids you're seeing laced with fentanyl and carfentanyl, basically a horse tranquilizer uh, now in people's um, stash of illegal drugs, they will die. They will overdose and die within the immediate period upon being released. So we know even before we build those data systems, and I'll touch on that briefly in a second, that this is a really vulnerable population to focus on. We are now not only treating people in the state correctional facilities, which have the majority of inmates in New Jersey, with medication-assisted treatment, all three types, uh, including uh, counseling, uh, but also uh, in our county jails. We're funding uh, several county jails uh, in their ability to purchase MAT, and for some of the MAT types, they're quite expensive, and uh, funding care navigators for people to uh, be able to be connected to the addiction treatment system on the outpatient level and be re-enrolled re in Medicaid uh, often when they leave. Unfortunately, federal law uh, bars Medicaid coverage of individuals while they're incarcerated. Uh, and it's difficult to get funding, uh, although I'm very grateful for the SAMHSA funding we got this year, over $20 million in technical assistance and uh, a lot of different interventions. Uh, but that still remains uh, a gap. So we're filling that gap with state funding, and it's very exciting. Uh, back to uh, Dr. Graff's point uh, quickly about knowing if we're making progress. You cannot know if you're making progress unless you have not only the metrics, but the data systems to capture those metrics uh, in a reasonable time frame, We're still operating with 2016 data to understand that's definitive on opioid overdose deaths two years ago. Uh, inexcusable, and that really prevents us from making progress because if all of the intervention uh, points, the metrics and the process of people going through that journey, like I mentioned, is a black box and you're only seeing deaths at the end of the trajectory, it's impossible to know if you're making progress and it's impossible to redirect your efforts to be able to actually make progress. Just, just to jump in, so when you are talking about data that, that is not solid, the data from the CDC is provisional over the past year, year and a half. Yeah. Well, uh, that data is largely gathered from uh, us from the state health agency. 
uh, and from uh, folks on the ground that are submitting that data, the medical examiner, uh, which is now in our department, and it takes time, unfortunately, to confirm deaths with those old systems. What we're trying to do, uh, and Governor Murphy has called this a quote-unquote money ball approach to the opioid epidemic, uh, we're starting to connect electronic health records together uh, in one uh, statewide interoperable system of health information called the New Jersey Health Information Network. Uh, we're taking our vital statistics information, which is much more real time uh, than medical examiner data to understand where the deaths are happening, who is dying and where. Uh, and we're really starting to build a treatment capacity versus demand uh, data system to understand where the needs are. Uh, that, I think, has been a huge gap across the country in having that level of data that's uh, last quarter instead of two years ago or last month instead of two years ago. Uh, and without those systems, it's really hard to know uh, how or if you're making progress. So, so if someone was to stand up and say, we have made progress between 2017 and 2018, you don't think the data is solid enough to make that argument? Unless they have a system of uh, understanding and capturing that data, uh, that, is, that isn't from traditional systems. Most states are still using medical examiner data, as is ours. Uh, the data systems that we're building, uh, the governor has allocated $100 million to the crisis. Uh, a large chunk of that is going to be infrastructure building for more real-time data collection. Uh, and I believe that has been an unfortunate area of underinvestment uh, across the country. We know uh, we have ASTO, we have several agencies that bring state health officials together. Uh, it's something that we talk about a lot. How do we get better data? How do we get more real-time data? Um, and we haven't yet seen a system uh, that for this crisis uh, is um, a model. Uh, and so we're trying to build that in New Jersey. Maybe pulling it back up to the national level, Dr. Volkow, Dr. McCants, Katz, how, how are you judging success, especially when there has been so much congressional focus, presidential focus on this issue, money that has been uh, steered to your agencies? What, what is the metric of, of improvement or, or even victory when it comes to fighting the opioid crisis? Perhaps we'll start with Dr. Volkow. Yeah, I think that obviously we would want as our main outcome for victory is that we see the, the overdose fatalities basically decreasing and disappearing. That would be the ultimate goal. And, and if you want me to even be more ambitious, I said that we address the problem of addiction in our country. Because what we're also observing right now, if you look at the CDC data, is that not only have we been seeing from data from 2016 significant increases in fatalities from fentanyl, we're also seeing very significant and very fast increases in fatalities from cocaine and methamphetamine. So recognizing that the opioid crisis, yes, is at the forefront, but we cannot keep our eyes off the ball rolling because we're seeing a wave of fatalities associated with cocaine and methamphetamine that are just going way, way, way up. And, and, and those, that's why I say there are two big overarching goals. We need to contain and control uh, these overdose fatalities, but we also need to address the problem of addiction in our country. That, to me, at the end of the day, is perhaps the most important component of it. And I completely agree, in order to be able to maximize um, and evaluate the extent to which our interventions are being beneficial, we need to have data that actually reflects real-time data. And this, of course, is one of the priorities uh, for, for the HHS agency to, to basically be able to provide us with that. Um, be, because again, how do you deploy your resources? It's going to be dependent on exactly where you're making progress. So I spoke about progress that we've made, and it's very valuable. Increasing medications, increasing access to naloxone, increasing the uh, training of clinicians in managing uh, addiction. That's extraordinarily important. But, but, but what are the consequences and how, if we are doing well in this area, but not on the other, we don't have the numbers properly right away, we cannot intervene. So data, building up on a database is very important. And the other one point that I do want to also recognize as, as fundamental, and it's clearly one of our priorities is how do we develop a scoring card of the treatment program so that you can actually have a sense of the quality of care of the treatment um, patients are getting, which we don't have 
for substance use disorders, but we have for other areas of medicine, and we shouldn't be treating them differently. And, and there is already significant evidence that actually identified what parameters are associated consistently with better <coughs> outcomes. And so there is a way of starting to rate facilities on the basis of those parameters. And I do know that Samsa and, and Dr. McCanns have spoken about it in terms of some of the things that are actually indispensable for a treatment to actually follow evidence-based practices. I, I want to go back to something that you said, talking about the, the rise in, in deaths linked to meth, uh, meth and cocaine um, and, and the problems there. How, how much of the focus right now is on solving yesterday's problems and, and opioid issues that have been really well deliberated versus focusing on the problems that are still to come? I think that because the crisis has been so overwhelming, it's natural that we have to focus on containing it. At the same time, and you can start to see that in part of the narratives on the priorities, coming to recognize that prevention of substance use disorders at the national level has to be a priority, both for the opioid use disorder crisis that we face, but also for the other crises that are behind and the crises that have been there all along. We have a problem with alcohol. I mean, the mortality from alcoholism in our country, what is 80,000 a year? We have a problem with, with tobacco. So we've known all along that addiction is creating an enormous mer uh, burden in morbidity and mortality, and we need to address it. So I think that as we start to see that Yes, a strategy for prevention is better uh, practices for prescribing opioids and for treating patients with pain properly. Another one relates to universal prevention interventions to protect people from developing substance use disorders. Dr. McCann's cats we've heard some of the challenges either on the state level, the national level, and understanding this problem from your desk, running SAMHSA, looking at the nation. What, what information do we still need what, what initiatives need to be invested in to make progress in, in this fight? So the, the, the issue of data, as all of my colleagues here have just, have just explained, is really a, a, a crucial one. Um, what we're doing at SAMHSA is we are collecting what we call client-level data from our program. So when we fund a state, when we fund a discretionary program, when we fund an organization, um, we require them to give us data about who that person is anonymously in terms of their attributes. You know, who, who is this person? What are their problems? We have just added diagnosis. Interestingly, um, when I got to SAMHSA, we had no information on what the clinical conditions were that were being treated through the dollars that were supporting those services. We will have that now. Uh, in addition, we are looking at issues. So one of the most important things to, that you can look at quickly in terms of determining whether a program is effective or not is whether a, a, a person is engaged. So do they come into the program and can you, can you get them going in that program and do they stay long enough to benefit from care. And we generally think about that uh, as at least six months. And we know this because we've had studies from the NIDA Clinical Trials Network that have looked at durations of treatment and relapse rates. And so we know, for example, we know very well that four months for opioid use disorder was ineffective in a large multi-site study. So, we've, so at SAMHSA, we're looking at when somebody comes in, we look at them at six months, we look at them when treatment ends, and we look at what their outcomes have been. So we're looking at very specific parameters of, of how that person was, was doing when they came into a program and how they're doing when they leave that program. That will help us to disseminate information to the nation about what kinds of programs are most effective. Um, all programs need to use evidence-based practices, but there's always going to be some nuances to how, and how any particular group uses those practices to best serve the people that, that they are working with. So we're gathering that data. That's a, that's a big initiative at SAMHSA. I will also tell you that, that while I agree that we need to see a, a decline in, in opioid-related deaths uh, to, as one parameter of success, um, we also need to know what's happening to people in terms of toxicities. So 
Not everybody, of course. Unfortunately, there are tens of thousands dying of opioid overdoses uh, every year. But there are far more who are suffering toxicities related to opioids and mixing opioids with other substances and other substances. And my point here is that we have now, uh, are we on the process of reinstituting something called the Drug Abuse Warning Network. This is a program that is placed at hospitals, rural and urban across the nation, that will provide us data on what kinds of toxicities are being seen as a result of substance misuse. Beyond the data, I'm, I'm curious about the caregivers, about the people who, who are needed to make the change that you want to see. And, and you've spoken about the need for medication-assisted treatment plus uh, uh, more community support. Are clinicians currently prepared to take on that role? And if not, what do they need? Um, clinicians at this point, um, I think, need more training. And that's why we've invested so much over this year in training and technical assistance programs. But we're doing more than that. So, so when, you, when, when you train clinicians, you do more than just provide them education about these disorders. You also reduce stigma because you help clinicians to understand that these are illnesses that can be treated. That's extremely important. Not only that, when you train clinicians, you increase access in a diverse uh, number of settings, be it primary care, be it specialty programs, and others. And so we need to do a lot more uh, around education. The other thing that needs to happen, and, and we have a new program this year that, that, um, that is a program that places what's called the data waiver training. This is the Drug Abuse Treatment Act of 2000. It's that, that training that is required of physicians and now um, certain nurse specialists and um, physician assistants so that they can get a waiver to prescribe buprenorphine from office-based settings to treat opioid use disorder. We call this program PCSS Universities. And what we are doing is we are embedding basic addiction training that leads to a data waiver within medical schools, physician assistant schools, nurse practitioner schools, because that mainstreams addiction as another illness, just another illness that our providers need to be competent in recognizing and addressing over the long, over the long term. So we are embedding this into uh, into universities, into uh, schools. We will be working to expand this over the years to come because when we teach before people graduate, when we teach our young practitioners that substance use disorders are prevalent, they affect so many people in our country in so many different ways, they can look like many illnesses and if you do not know how to recognize something that is a substance use disorder, you may misdiagnose it as, as a, an illness the person doesn't have. So it becomes very important to embed in our pre-graduate training so that we mainstream substance use disorder treatment. Dr. McCants Katz just spoke eloquently on the stigma in, in healthcare and, and in the community around opioid use and, and uh, addiction. Sometimes skepticism and stigma can go hand in hand. You have advocated, Dr. Ellen Hall, for yeah. medical marijuana uh, as a treatment for opioid use disorder. What is the argument there? What is the evidence for why medical marijuana could be a solution? Well, first, let me um, just say that I appreciate Dr. McCann's cast most recent comments about embedding uh, MAT training and trying to um, really uh, overcome the stigma early in people's medical careers. Uh, I painted a bleak picture of New Jersey, um, but one thing that we are doing is in Rutgers University, the biggest state university we have, every single medical school graduate will be trained uh, on how to use MAT. Uh, and I think that's a practice that we really need to spread. Uh, another area of stigma, as Dan just mentioned, uh, is in marijuana. And I guess I'll go through a, a list of um, assumptions that most physicians have about marijuana and try to dispel each of them as best as I can. Um, the first myth is that this is just a roundabout way for recreational use. And while I concede that the way that some states have implemented it has made it look like that because there hasn't been oversight 
In New Jersey, we've set up a system that's much different. There are approved conditions for which physicians uh, have to adhere to in terms of a rigorous diagnosis. Uh, they have to, according to the Board of Medical Examiners, uh, do a full history and physical of every patient and write up a consult note, just like you would for any other condition. Uh, and they're held to that standard uh, with enforcement. Uh, and so I think by um, the making sure that you have the right checks and balances in place with a state level program, uh, you can avoid what has happened in other states where essentially it's just a way for people to get uh, it for recreational use. The second myth is that um, it's a gateway drug to other drugs. So are you just replacing addiction of one uh, substance with another? Um, there is data that actually argues against that. Uh, there are two landmark studies this year published in the Journal of the Medi American Medical Association that showed an association in states that have medical marijuana programs, uh, not only with reduced opioid prescribing, and this was both Medicare population and one study looked at the Medicaid population, which spans all ages. Um, uh, there's reduced opioid prescribing, but it also buttressed findings from a, another JAMA study from several years ago that showed those states also have an overall lower opioid overdose mortality. It was difficult to argue that it was because of marijuana being available. Uh, the studies this year helped support the causal argument that the availability of marijuana as its use as an alternative to opioid treatment is a major um, uh, reason. And so if it was in fact a gateway drug and its increased availability was a gateway drug to opioid use and other uh, substance use deaths, you would have seen the opposite result in these studies. Um, the third is that because there is so little research, and by the way, that's because the federal government is archaic in its classification of marijuana as a Schedule I drug with no uh, demonstrated therapeutic benefit, there are studies that show that in fact does have benefit for many conditions, although they could be better and larger. Um, we've seen that there is absolutely no comparison in terms of the safety and risk profile of marijuana versus opioids, versus steroids, which are commonly used to treat inflammatory conditions and many other conditions, and benzodiazepines, so many other conditions and drugs that medical marijuana also treats. The grand total of people who've died from a marijuana overdose is zero. Zero ever. Compare that to opioid overdose deaths. Compare that to deaths from benzodiazepine withdrawal. Compare that to deaths from alcohol withdrawal, as Dr. Volka mentioned. So um, the uh, downside risk of its medicinal use is low, which is why we're comfortable recommending it for many conditions despite the lack of large phase three uh, clinical trials that are well conducted and well studied, again, because of the federal funding barrier. We're, we're coming to the end of our panel, and I, I have a closing question for all of the panelists, which is, uh, if, if you were telling your successor one thing to do and one thing not to do, one thing to avoid, what would that be? But before you answer that, I'm going to, well, well, while you think quickly, I just want to recap three themes that I think have come out of this panel. One would be, uh, as, as articulated by Dr. Volkow at the beginning, the heterogeneity of, of this crisis and issue, and the bi uh, biological basis of behavior, and the need for the interweaving of different services and recovery. Dr. Ellen Hall spoke on that too. Uh, second, the value of collaboration whether that was Dr. Graff talking about Horizon, Milken, the DEA, Drug Enforcement Agency in New Jersey working together, Dr. Alan Hall talking about working with the Department of Corrections and the collaboration to, to attack on all fronts at the same time, and certainly, last and, and definitely not least, combating uh, stigma and skepticism from Dr. McCann's Katz talking about mainstreaming some of these issues so young doctors understand them from, from their training to alternate treatments that maybe had been dismissed in the past. So three of the many important topics that came out today, but perhaps three themes that connect a lot of the points together. So now that you've had a minute and a half to think about my, my final question again, if you were talking to your successor, Dr. Wolkow, Dr. McCann's Katz, or, or perhaps Dr. Elna Hall, you're talking to one of the other state health commissioners or another health insurer, what is the one thing you would tell that person to do, and what is the one thing you would tell that person to avoid? Dr. Volkow. I mean, and again, it just jumped into my brain, and I think that it would be something that I would tell my successor, but it's something that I would tell to everybody that's sitting up here. 
And it's the reality that in order for us to address the crisis, we need to optimally learn how to work with one another in the most productive ways. And that is fundamental. So many of the advances that we can bring through science are meaningless if we don't partner with SAMHSA to implement them. And the same thing, if we don't partner with communities, as much as we may want to say this is the evidence base, they may not necessarily um, integrate them into what they are doing. So that notion of dialogue with the other and cooperation between organizations and between organizations and uh, um, private industry, between private industry, organizations, government, and communities is fundamental. And so one of the challenges that I used to sort of say, oh, my job is very easy. I get the brightest people to work for drug abuse. Now, another big challenge is how do we integrate those efforts in a cohesive fashion. So that would be what I would say. And I say, I say it to all of us because I think that we all have an opportunity to participate in controlling the opioid crisis. What I would also say never to do, never become complacent. Don't ever put yourself into the position that you know all the answers. Because first of all, this crisis is changing very, very rapidly. And there is not one solution for every situation. And you have to recognize the value that those that are actually trying to solve the problem, um, how they are dealing with it, how valuable that information is. So never, ever become complacent. It becomes, I think, because our brain probably is hardwired like that, very easy to sort of polarize things. This works and this doesn't. And as and the moderator, I cannot be complacent because we're running out of time. But <laughs> partnership, <laughs> fundamental, don't be complacent. <laughs> Dr. Elna Hall, what you would recommend, what you would recommend to avoid? Um, I would recommend to avoid disrespecting the organic partnerships at the local level uh, that have preceded you. Uh, that's one thing that I've seen, especially in New Jersey, we have a very home rule culture where people primarily identify with their community, their city, then their state, then their country. Um, and it's important to really respect those partnerships that exist and work with them and within them uh, to be able to institute change. Dr. McCann-Skatz? I would say that the important thing is to, is to talk to people, um, to listen to what people have to say. And, uh, and not to isolate. It's easy, it's easy within Washington to, to isolate. You have to get out and talk to people that are living with these, these um, problems, and that's how you learn how to, how to direct policy. Get out of Washington is always good advice. <laughs> Dr. Graff? Uh, so a couple of things. One, I think, is focusing on, you know, do focus on comprehensive solutions, not individual magic bullets or point solutions. I think the panel hit that pretty hard. And then the second one is, know your own limitations, know that you are not the expert. Um, you know, to me, uh, today, if, if you saw my colleagues' lips moving while I was talking, you were right. Uh, the real experts are in the room. Dr. Syra Jan, who leads our pharmacy group, and Suzanne Kunis, who's in charge of our, um, our behavioral health, they're the real experts. They're the folks that are on the ground doing this work daily. Value them. Very well timed at the end of the panel when you already said you didn't know anything about insurance. <laughs> the actual experts right there. Um, thank you to this panel. Thank you to everyone in the audience and enjoy milking. Thank you.